the world as it is known today is a far larger place than might ever be observed by any single mortal. Even to the greatest explorers of the elves and dwarves to whom fate has gifted many centuries, there will always remain unvisited places, mysteries and astonishments on which their eyes will never gaze. The vastness of the world is both its greatest treasure and final tragedy. Knowledge of its place amongst the heavens, of the immense continents and tempestuous oceans that mark its surface, and the civilizations that dwell here has therefore only been possible through the work of many. Their combined efforts have pushed the boundaries of maps and empires, but their work is not yet complete. Even within the lands declared thoroughly surveyed and charted, secrets remain, and of distant lands and peoples, no supposed fact exists that is not disputed or contradicted. The known world is a misnomer, nothing more than a precarious foundation, and perhaps destined to forever lay beyond a total understanding. The greatest example of this is the study of astromancy, which posits that the world is only one amongst many within a broader cosmos. Ten planets are believed to orbit the Sun, of which the known world is the fourth least distant. 400 days are required to complete this orbit, and this cycle is responsible for the rhythm of the seasons. The world is in turn orbited by two lesser worlds, or moons, Manslieb, which shines a bright white, and Morslieb, whose unpredictable course and sickly green glow lead many to label it unnatural or aligned with the dark powers. Of the known world itself, however, several geographic regions dominate its surface. Each is composed of one or more continents and usually ringed by great oceans. The exact number and boundaries of these regions are disputed, however, and might be interpreted differently when viewed through a specific geographic or cultural perspective. The first of these regions is known to the nations of mankind that dwell there as the Old World, and it is a symptom of human arrogance that this name is sometimes used interchangeably to refer to the entire planet. In its most common use, however, the Old World encompasses the northwestern region of the planet's largest landmass. Its boundaries are typically delineated by the Great Ocean to the west, the towering range of the World's Edge Mountains to the east, and the desolate and arid regions of Araby and the Badlands to the south. The northwestern Isle of Albion is sometimes included within the region, though its mysterious and largely unsettled nature means it is neither a true part of the Old World nor entirely separate from it. The Old World is famous for its dense temperate forests, broken only by long strings of mountains, winding rivers, and the plains and grasslands confined mainly to the coasts. The Grey Mountains which run north to south, and the Black Mountains which extend west to east in particular, divide the region, and have guided the development of local civilizations and cultures throughout their history. Together with the World's Edge Mountains, these ranges form the heart of dwarf civilization. The mightiest peaks have been crafted into intricate fortress cities known as Karaks, which today act as semi-independent city-states, and the last vestiges of the former dwarf empire. Many more, however, have been lost to savage races of the Old World, greenskins, beastmen, or worse things. Perhaps the greatest sign of their decline is the Dwarf Underway, a vast interconnected highway of tunnels that once ran beneath every mountain range and is today mostly abandoned. With the decline of the Dwarves, the Old World has become synonymous with the nations of men, and especially the Empire of Sigmar Heldenhammer located at its center. Today, it is widely considered to be the preeminent nation of humankind in the world pushing the boundaries of scientific discovery through uniquely imperial innovations. Loosely aligned through a shared history, culture, and religion, the Empire is in fact 11 distinct electoral provinces. These provinces arose on the banks of the region's largest rivers, with the River Reich, River Talabek, River Aver, and River Stur acting as vital networks of imperial trade. One former province, however, Sylvania, was beset by the curse of vampirism, 
and even today, remains a blight on the old world that can seemingly never be erased. Its forests are somehow darker and twisted, while the power of the sun, even at midday, is somehow lessened. On the southern side of the Grey Mountains from the Empire lies its major rival, the Kingdom of Bretonia. Blessed with a kinder climate, and majority of the old world's most easily cultivated land, Bretonia has been able to endure as a major power, even while rigidly adhering to a feudal system most outsiders consider entirely antiquated. Its code of chivalry and distinct religion likewise have preserved the Bretonian state, and prevented it from being absorbed into its northern neighbor. Separating the Empire and Bretonia are the common elements of the mountains, savage tribes of greenskins and other creatures, or defiant dwarf fortresses, but three other distinct territories have helped keep these nations apart. The first is the so-called Wasteland, which clings to the northern coast of the Old World. Once an imperial province, today it is a site of the independent city-state of Marienburg, the most prosperous port in the Old World. The second is the Forest of Athel Lorren, widely known as the homeland of the Wood Elves, but also a great many stranger and more dangerous things within its deepest paths and glades. The last is the Realm of the Border Princes, a comparatively harsher land, yet blessed with minerals that has attracted petty lords, adventurers, and mercenaries from across the Old World. A multitude of lesser kingdoms exist here, contending with greenskins, dwarves, pirates, marauders, and one another, for the chance of carving out a greater nation. The northern marches of the Old World are dominated by Kislev, a nation whose border with the Empire is constantly in dispute, but otherwise bounded by the Sea of Claws and the World's Edge Mountains. Kislev is considered a wild and untamed land, with its few cities existing as isolated stone islands in a desolate sea of rolling steppes, frigid rivers, and frozen lakes and inlets. Yet, despite its relative poverty, the Kislevite people maintain a deep connection with their land that stretches into the realm of sorcery. While Kislev can be inhospitable to human life, the northernmost peninsula of Norska remains the most dangerous part of the Old World. Covered in jagged mountains and pierced by hundreds of fjords, Norska is a realm of barbarians where scattered human tribes compete with one another and fierce creatures for survival. There are essentially no permanent settlements within Norska, as even the most developed coastal ports are regularly attacked by blood krakens or other predators. The southern expanse of the Old World is distinguished by two great peninsulas, Tilia and Astalia. Warmer and drier than the lands of the Empire or Bretonia, and beset by more mountainous and rocky terrain, no single kingdom has flourished enough to dominate either place. Instead, both are split between rival city-states and kingdoms, whose cutthroat political intricacies, shifting alliances, and constant betrayals have led to universal adoption of mercenary companies famed across the whole of the Old World. The nations of Astalia and Tilia are also embroiled in constant competition for control over the maritime trade routes that extend into the Great Ocean. No direct, safe route exists between the two, as the cursed lands of the Blighted Swamps have largely severed Tilia and Astalia from one another. If the record of the dwarves can be believed, a thriving human city, one of the greatest of the world, once existed there. Today, however, only ruins remain, from which many strange and ominous noises supposedly echo. The second major region of the planet is the enormous continent that lies directly to the south of the Old World. Its great diversity of climate, competing cultures, and tremendous distances has impeded any all-encompassing overview or even a single unifying name. Instead, the continent is usually divided into three smaller subregions. Serving as a direct land bridge to the Old World are the Badlands, a comparatively thinner strip of territory bordered to the west and east by the Great Ocean and the Sea of Dread. Aptly named, the Badlands are characterized by arid plains, from which rise many strange and twisted rock formations, some of which might in fact be the bones of ancient creatures. 
Only the marshes of madness break this arid monotony, but the labyrinth of waterways and swamps within are wholly cursed and avoided by all but the desperate. Haunted ruins are said to be prevalent within, most of which are all that remains of mankind's ancient Strigos empire, though others defy explanation. While most such ruins lay empty, some contend that within others can be found the last degenerate remnants of fallen civilizations or other such lost races. It is the Greenskins, however, that have claimed uncontested dominion over the Badlands. Orcs, goblins, and the other creatures that gather at their sides are present here in larger numbers than nearly anywhere else on Earth. Countless tribes roam the steppes, enough to overwhelm the entire Old World, if they should ever cease their infighting. Jutting out into the Great Ocean is Araby, the site of the harshest deserts in the world, in which none but the hardiest creatures might survive. Water is scarce, and when it falls, it does so in such tremendous torrents as to be nearly as deadly as a drought. Only on the coasts, where more reliable streams flow from nearby mountains, is human settlement possible. The sultans of Araby are thought of as savage and backwards compared to the kings and emperors of the Old World, but they possess a proud civilization. Arabians are energetic and imaginative, and through their superior advances in the sciences, medicine, and architecture, have created trade empires the equal of any across the planet. The remainder of the continent is known as the Southlands, a forbidding country of desert wastelands and ruined tomb cities that slowly gives way to an impregnable jungle. Only a few permanent settlements are present here, mainly on the coasts, as to control the neighboring sea routes. Those who have attempted to travel even just a few miles into the jungle and survived have spoken of an impossibly dense web of trees, vines, and swamps. Despite these dangers, persisting tales of lost cities constructed entirely of gold, lost dwarf holds, and other such treasures have ensured a steady flow of adventurers set their sights on the Southlands. Of all the dangers that might be found in the Badlands, Araby, and the Southlands, there are none so inescapable and enduring as the power that still lingers in the land of the dead. A borderland whose outer edge extends into each of the three surrounding regions, this place is all that remains of ancient Nehekara, once the mightiest and most prosperous realm of men. Today, it is a haunted place, where the cries of ancient spirits can still be heard, in the ruins of forgotten cities and great mortuary temples. The dead find no rest here, doomed to walk the sands in a grim parody of the lives they once lived. This is the work of Nagash, the great necromancer, whose apocalyptic rebirth as an aspirant god of death unleashed a curse upon the world that can never be removed, even millennia after his destruction. Across the Great Ocean is another vast landmass known to some as the New World. Its southern continent, directly across from the Southlands, is another stretch of endless jungles named Lustria. So similar are Lustria and the Southlands that scholars speculate they might once have been joined together while the world was still young. Indeed, when viewed from afar, this western continent might seem little different from the Southlands, but within Lustria, every danger has been amplified. Its claustrophobic jungles are an entirely alien landscape, with even the highest mountains and entire seas choked by titanic skywoods, and a canopy so dense that little light can reach the jungle floor. A great amount of this plant life is carnivorous, poisonous, or in some other fashion hazardous to mortal life. Mighty prehistoric carnivores stalk these jungles, while far more foul things lie in wait within the vines or beneath the surface of stagnant marshes. Yet, there are also riches in Lustria, cities of gold supposedly dwarfing those of the Southlands. The denizens of those cities, known to the few who have seen them as the Lizardmen, are said to be savage in deed and heart, yet also possessing a deep knowledge of the world that belies their primitive appearance. North of Lustria is Nagaroth, named by the elves the Land of Chill. It is an equally unforgiving land of barren windswept plains and sluggish black rivers stained by the touch of sorcery. Their blackened waters carve winding canyons and deep ravines into the frozen ground, providing the only respite from the biting winds. 
Only in a few places is the soil thick enough for plants to grow, and it is often nothing more than sickly pines, a pale reflection of those found in the old world. Only elven exiles and renegades have chosen to settle in Nagaroth, and they have become as cruel and unforgiving as the lands they inhabit. Instead, the true center of elvish civilization continues to be Ulthuan, a landmass roughly the shape of a hollow ring located in the center of the Great Ocean. The famed Anuli Mountains line Ulthuan, and their peaks disappear into deep mists of raw magic, where time can begin to flow strangely and thoughts can coalesce into physical form. These mountains are steeped in magic because Ulthuan as a whole acts as a focal point for the winds of energy that blow across the world. In order to prevent sorceries from consuming the world, the elves in ancient times wove into being a great vortex meant to absorb excess magic. It remains there to this day and has left a unique mark on Ulthuan, with the sky surrounding it full of exotic lights and otherworldly music. Ten elven kingdoms guard the Vortex and their greater homeland, roughly split into the inner and outer kingdoms, depending on which side of the Anuli Mountains they claim territory. The remainder of the world has, until recent centuries, been little more than myths and legends crafted from the tales of the few explorers to return from these distant realms. Yet, as more pioneers and caravans brave the network of trade routes that run to the far east, Known collectively as the Ivory Road, what were once mere names and warnings on the edge of maps are slowly coming into focus. Far to the west of the New World, or well to the east of the World's Edge Mountains, the Celestial Empire of Grand Cathay forms another region of the world and second great axis of human civilization. It is far larger and more populous than any nation of mankind found in the Old World with even its smaller market towns dwarfing many imperial cities. Cathay spans a wild and varied continent. Its heartland is filled with snaking rivers that produce an endless supply of grain, while its surrounding territories feature towering mountains, prosperous coasts, ancient forests, and wide, sunny plains. Records of travelers tell of jade cities, wondrous spices, and textiles, but above all, the inexhaustible armies in service to the immortal Dragon Emperor. Yet, even here, horrible wastelands brought about by ancient cataclysms endure. The Warpstone Desert shines with the raw energy of magic, and any who travel through this baleful place risks mutation or worse. The northern frontier of Cathay borders a similarly desolate region, defended by the legendary Great Bastion, the single greatest structure ever created by men. Other nations are said to exist in the Far East, but of them, even less is known. The kingdoms of Ind, known to some as the land of a thousand gods, and thought to stretch beneath the southern frontiers of Cathay, home to strange creatures, verdant rainforests, and an eastern despot who stylizes himself the Monkey King. To Ind's east lies the hinterlands of Koresh, reportedly a haunted place mimicking Lustria, yet overrun with dread snake men blood naga queens, and other grotesque creatures. As in the Southlands, only a few settlements exist here and cling to well-protected harbors, for none but the most insane or brave will delve too deeply into the jungles. Further off the coast of Cathay and Koresh is the Isles of Nippon, reminiscent of Cathay in character, yet with their own unique religion and culture seemingly derived from a divine sun. Feudal warlords compete with one another across its many islands, but when united, possess such a mastery over the sea so as to even threaten Cathay or more distant ports. For most of their history, however, the Nippon have remained isolationist and closed off their cities to outsiders. Separating the nations of the East from those of the Old World and the West are the Darklands. Volcanoes and earthquakes have split this cheerless land apart bringing to the surface stagnant pools of tar and oil, whose fumes merge with ash to form perpetually blackened skies. The dim light and choking air ensures the lands remain dead to all plant life, save wild, gnarled thorns. The volcanic activity and gaping pits bring up the rarest and most valuable minerals of the earth, 
and the Dark Lands are deeply coveted by many races for its abundant riches. But these blasted territories are the home of the Orcs, and they are present here in such numbers that would overwhelm even those of the neighboring Badlands or any other region on the planet. Though they rarely speak of it to outsiders, the Darklands are also the home to the eastern remnants of the Dwarf Empire. They have endured in this brutal landscape since their race was first fractured, embracing a terrible god they name the Father of Darkness. The Uzkul Drazar, or Chaos Dwarves as they are more commonly known, rarely venture out into the wider world, but the plumes of smoke that rise from their fortress city and the roar of machinery that is carried on the wind seems to indicate that this isolationism is nearing its end. Where the world's edge mountains protect the old world from the worst elements of the Darklands, Cathay is similarly protected by the eastern mountains of Morn. Beset by even greater volcanic activity, the mountain range is in a constant state of flux, with eruptions and glacial flows significantly altering the landscape, often with little warning. Even the dwarves found it difficult to establish their holds here, and the entire region has been overrun by ogres, rhinoxen, mournfang, and the legendary yetis, thought to hunt among the tallest peaks. A great many smaller islands and landmasses might be found off the coasts of the world, and it is believed that possibly even some lost continents might remain undiscovered somewhere within the vast expanses of the ocean. Yet, for the most part, even if certain regions remain more mysterious than others, an imperfect but useful overview of the world has been established. There remains, however, and will perhaps always be, gaps in knowledge. For in spite of every effort, there are certain places on the map of which any understanding is impossible. The greatest and most dire of these are the Chaos Wastes. Located at the world's northern and southern poles are two great wounds in reality. A realm of emotion and malignant powers exists coterminously with the known world, and in these devastated landscapes, it spills outwards unchallenged, mutating and corrupting every element of nature. The further north or south one heads, the stranger the horizon becomes, as light and shadow, time and distance, split apart into wonders and terrors that defy mortal understanding. Eventually, it is possible to enter the realm of chaos itself, from which the forces of chaos emanate, its dark gods hold dominion, and the raw powers of magic flow out onto the world. Little is known of the southern chaos wastes, for they remain separated from the mortal races by a thousand leagues of ocean, but the northern wastes have no such barrier. From Kislev to Cathay, the chaos wastes threaten civilization. Within can be found worshippers of the dark gods, mutated creatures, and even demons whose existence would be impossible anywhere else. Though the exact boundaries of the chaos wastes ebb and flow with the tides of magic, it can never truly be sealed off from the mortal world, save perhaps by some as of yet undiscovered miracle. The most ancient records inherited by the elves and dwarves, yet far older than either race, tell of an era when the world was without the taint of chaos and instead shepherded under the careful direction of the Old Ones. Whether gods themselves or mortals of unparalleled power, they were thought to travel the cosmos the way men might sail an ocean and for some unknown reason, took an active interest in this particular world. They moved it closer to the sun so life might flourish, shaped its continents and islands to their liking, and even guided the evolution of native life. At each of the poles, they constructed enormous gates so they might travel to and from the world in an instant, linking it into a web of millions of other worlds. The disaster is believed to have come suddenly. While the exact cause is unknown, the polar gates collapsed on themselves and their implosion created rifts across realities into the realm of chaos. Sorcerous energies, demons, and warpstone, the raw stuff of magic spilled across the world. Seas churned, forests shook, and in place of the northern gate, a second great moon, Morslebe, slowly formed in burning skies. The dread masters of chaos became aware of this mortal world, and it soon became another battleground in their great game. 
whether the old ones were destroyed in this great catastrophe, or merely abandoned the world to its fate, has been a lingering mystery with no easy answer. Regardless, the defense of the world was left to the surviving servants of the Old Ones and the species they had cultivated. The dwarves and elves rose to prominence in this legendary time, and each would claim sole credit for the eventual triumph of the mortal realm over the forces of chaos. Yet, the rift at the poles could never be closed, and so chaos became an omnipresent force in the world, a sword that hung above every mortal soul. With the defeat of Chaos, the Dwarf and Elven Empires competed with one another for power and influence across the world. The war between these superpowers, combined with internal strife and natural disasters, exhausted both nations, and sparked a gradual decline from which neither has been able to recover. In their absence, the races of men began to rise, first in the ancient empires of Nehekara and Cathay, and slowly in the more modern states that today span the old world. As the forces of chaos grow in power, and the resolve of the mortal races falter that the planet has entered a new stage, cannot be denied. Both heralded prophets and crazed madmen declare that these are the end times, the hour in which the dark gods will make their final war upon the world and extinguish the last sparks of hope. Perhaps it is even true and this vibrant world will soon collapse under the weight of chaos, and the failure of the Old Ones will be complete. But the world is more than just maps and charts, mountains and oceans, nations and empires. Amongst the untold number of worlds in the cosmos, it is unique, a place of monsters, gods and heroes. And even if the world one day crumbles, its glory and the glory of all within it can live on, so long as one remains to remember it. Thanks to Creative Assembly for supporting our investigation across the known world, but that investigation is just getting started. Join us on our Twitch channel one hour after this video went live, where we'll be conquering immortal empires in total war, Warhammer 3. You'll find the links in the description.